Okay, so uh, welcome to this uh, uh, second lecture by me and, and your course and an introduction to nanotechnology. And today I'm going to talk uh, first about uh, iron optics and its uses for nanotechnology and I'll take... So I will uh, discuss mainly iron optics and how accelerators and, and mass spectrometers uh, work. Uh, and just mention a little bit the many uses they have in nanotechnology. Um, there are people here who are more expert than me on some of the uses. Um, and then uh, the second half will be on a specific uh, topic, which is ion, uh, ion traps, which, um, which many of the results that I told you about uh, last, last week about cluster physics uh, were, were actually uh, done in ion traps. And ion traps are a wonderful tool for, for studying how properties evolve with size. Uh, because you, you can uh, trap and study uh, uh, particles of every, di every different size. Um, now, what you see here on, um, on uh, this drawing is uh, one of the most uh, primitive ion optics experiments, and uh, that's where everything started. It started from uh, a branch which was called cathode ray tubes. So what is a cathode ray tube? So it actually starts in the first days of electricity when people started uh, doing experiments with electricity and they noticed that if they uh, put a high voltage between two uh, electrodes, then sometimes you have sparks between them. Okay, what is a spark? A spark looks like lightning and, um, and they thought it's the same thing as lightning. So Benjamin Franklin, he showed that a spark is a, is a, is a you know the kite experiment of uh, Benjamin Frank Franklin. He, he had the kite in a in a stormy day, and he showed that that lightning is actually an electric phenomenon. As, and here they also see they you put a charge between two plates, you get sparks, and you have current flowing uh, through the air between the two electrodes. So then they started uh, investigating this phenomenon more and more, and trying to understand what it is. What are these uh, stuff that are, what is this current that is flowing between the electrodes? Okay. So one thing they noticed is that if you pump all the air, then uh, you can have these, uh, the particles that are producing this current, they can flow for a much longer distance. So the idea is that from one electrode, which we call the cathode, on which you apply the negative, uh, um, negative potential, then something is coming out, something negatively charged is coming out, and it's flying towards the end electrode, and um, and on the way it can uh, can collide with air. And if it collides with air, then you see nice colors uh, from the collision, but it doesn't reach the end. Or if you pump out the air, then you don't see these sparkling uh, lights, but you, but uh, you can get it all the way to to the detector. And then you can also manipulate it on the way. Okay, you can uh, deflect it, so you can put an electric field that causes the particles to go up and down. Yeah, and you can also focus them. So, we, so they, in principle, if they come out, they'll go in every direction. So you can actually make them focus like a lens to reach the detector, not to scatter on the way. Um, and this is a drawing from maybe the most um, uh, famous uh, experiment on these cathode ray tubes, where by applying either an electric field or magnetic field, uh, John J. Thompson managed to measure the, the charge to mass ratio of these particles. And what he realized is it's the same particles no matter what is used as the electrode. Okay, so he takes a gold electrode and then he expects that gold particles come off. Then he replaces it by an aluminum electrode and he sees You'd expect that aluminum particles fly off, but he measures and he realizes it's the same particles that come off. Okay, what are the particles that come off? Electrons. Electrons, right. So uh, they're subatomic particles, and so this was uh, a Nobel Prize. It's considered the discovery of the electron. It, uh, it also shows us that, uh, that atoms are not the basic uh, unit of matter. You can uh, have atoms actually have an internal structure. Uh, so this is a famous uh, experiment, but if you look at this experiment, you, uh, 
um, you can see traces of a lot of technology that came later. So if, you, uh, if you're not too young, then uh, your televisions used to be very wide, and they were called CRT uh, monitors, or uh, CRT is, is uh, an acronym for cathode ray tubes. This is a cathode ray tube, and the idea is that you can, uh, you can have at the end, you can have an electrode that is covered with a phosphorus material. So when the electrons hit it, you have light. And now you can uh, move the electron with these uh, electrodes and have it impringe on uh, wherever you want and this way produce a picture. So this is, cons so, um, so this is how uh, the monitors used to work. Um, when they hit the electrode, they hit with a lot of uh, energy. So not only you, you get light, but you also get x-rays. So uh, retin produced the x-rays um, from a cathode ray tube. So there's a lot of fundamental science that came. I think uh, Rentgen's discovery was the first Nobel Prize, or the second one. And, uh, so uh, a lot of Nobel Prizes and a lot of technology came from, from this idea. Um, and then you realize, OK, you can produce not only electrons, you can also accelerate ions. What is ions? Yeah, ions are charged particles, so ions include electrons. They also include anions. Anions are negatively charged atoms or molecules. And cations, which are negatively charged, uh, or positively charged. Yes? No. What is the negative? I, I'll write it in the, on the board in a second. Um, so, um, in a sec, I'll, I'll write it in a second, OK? But then with these particles, once you accelerate them, then you can um, have all kinds of uses. And these are a few uses that you can find in the nano building uh, just next door. So for, for one, one example is with electrons. You can use electrons just like you use light in a microscope. You can do the same thing with electrons and have an electron microscope. What is the, uh, okay, what is the disadvantage of an electron microscope? Sorry? The charge of the electrons which might uh, inter uh, interrupt the sample in the Okay, what else? You need a sample to do so that. It has to be extremely clean. Why does it have to be extremely clean? It is too, if it has like some sort of resins on it, it can diffract the electron, it can interact with it. Uh, Elon, what do you say? That the sample needs to be conducting. Uh, well, the main thing is this has to be in vacuum. A regular microscope, you can have it in here. Here, you, ha you have to have it in vacuum. So if you have a dirty sample, it will ruin the vacuum and so on. But what is the main uh, advantage of electron microscopes? It's the diffraction limit. No diffraction limit. Okay, so light has a size. It's called the wavelength of light. And you can't go much below the, d the wavelength of light. So you're... you're uh, um, the, low, the best uh, resolution is around 200 nanometers. Here you can go to picometers. So it's, uh, why? Because electrons also have a wavelength. It's the, the wave wavelength, but it's much smaller. Okay. So um, then another experiment that you can find downstairs here in the uh, nano building is the IBA machine. What you have here is an accelerator, and we'll explain how this, this kind of an accelerator works. Uh, which accelerates particles to, um, to uh, energies of millions of electron volts. So it's like accelerating something with a potential difference of a million volts. Uh, and then they shoot it on a sample. And then, for example, what happens is it excites the atom in the sample. The atoms emit x-ray. And by measuring the x-ray, you know exactly the atomic composition of the sample. And this is one of the many uses you have for... It's bugs, scattering. Yeah. And, that, and, um, and you... And there's many uses, many other uses you can have when you have a um, million uh, volt beam uh, hitting the surface. Um, one of the uses is to uh, treat surfaces. Is that the proton accelerator? Sorry? Is that accelerating protons? It, yeah, I think it's accelerating protons. Protons are cations, yeah. are positively charged. But, uh, but the accelerator works on anything in principle, whatever ion source you have here. Do you really need a voltage uh, drop of um, one million volts? So if you want to have a nice uh, IBA, you want to have a nice Bragg scattering, nice X-ray spectrum, then the higher the energy, the better. 
because then you you interact with the nucleus uh, rather than interacting with with the electrons uh, being stuck on the surface and so on. So um, um, and then you can by shooting atoms and ions on surfaces you can treat the surface in all kinds of ways. Um, and I think Noel is a great specialist on on this technique. It's called ion sputtering. Um, and I think he can uh, pass you a course on this if you want. Um, and there's many, many other techniques. Focused ion beams is another way. Uh, another th thing that you don't have here is something called soft landing. So you can make actually very complicated molecules or clusters or biomolecules and you can, uh, and you can cover them with, on a surface. So, so in this way, in, this, uh, in these kinds of experiments, you, you don't want to hit the surface very strongly, but you want to softly uh, have ions hitting the surface. Okay, so, um, so a little bit... Yeah, sorry, it's... Okay, so iron is an electrically charged particle. Examples you have electrons, cat ions. positively So if you have an atom that is neutral and you take away an electron, then it becomes a cation, a positively charged. Or if you give it an extra electron, then it becomes an anion, a negatively charged. And you can have them actually charged multiple times. You can take two, two electrons away and then it's doubly charged. Okay, so, um, so in the cathode ray tube experiment that I showed, then... Um, Sorry, it was drawn the up other way. So we had the cathode from which the, the electrons came out. Then there were lenses and deflectors to uh, manipulate the beam. And in the end, there was the detector. The cathode? This. Yeah. So in the experiment, there was cathode, there was a lens deflector and the phosphor screen and these are, are the general uh, kind of schematics of any kind of technology so in the beginning we'll have an ion source in the middle we'll have ion optics and in the end, we'll have a um, detector or a sample that we want to shoot at. 
And we'll talk about each one of these uh, elements. Before that, what is the big advantage to working with ions? Versus, uh, Versus neutral particles. Well, you can manipulate them with the fields. Exactly. Okay, what's your name? Eliyahu. Eliyahu? So just as Eliyahu says, the big advantage of working with ions, the reason they're so useful for all these technologies that we've mentioned, is that they're positively charged, which means that you can manipulate them easily with electric and magnetic fields. Manipulations can we do? So, for example, we can accelerate them. You can diffle them by mass with um, a magnetic field. Yeah, so I'll take. I'll do something more. Uh, so, uh, Yuval said uh, you can mass select them. Let's do. Let's call it analyze them because you can analyze them in men in other ways. Okay. So, for example. You can uh, focus and deflect. You can do corkscrew uh, motions. Uh. <coughs> you can do corkscrew motion if you want. You can trap them and um, and manipulate them. Well, so these are all kinds of examples for what you can do with charged particles. All of these things are possible in principle to do also with neutral particles, but it's a lot, a lot harder. Okay? So you can accelerate neutral particles, you can't reach the same acceleration voltages or energies that you do with ions. And you can do it only for very specific uh, molecules. For instance, if a molecule has an electric dipole moment, then with an inhomogeneous electric field you can, you can uh, accelerate it. But it's very hard. It's a very small force, and um, and it only works for molecules with a high dipole moment. It doesn't work for every molecule. Okay, you can uh, mass select. You can you can do a lot of things also with neutral particles, but uh, it's a lot easier with ions. What is the dis? Sorry. What is the main disadvantage of ions that you have to know before you start doing anything with ions? Okay, so, so you'll, we'll get to breakdown of voltages, but that's not the disadvantage of ions. Yes, they're, they're free radicals, right? Okay, so ions, um, you say they interact with each other. So they don't only interact with the electric fields we put, they also interact with each other. And what is the force that you have between ions? Let's say you have only electrons. They repel each other. Okay, so Coulomb repul the Coulomb force between like charges is repulsion. This means that you can't have too many ions together because they simply repel each other and blow apart. So small okay. signal. So the main disadvantage is low quantity. So, uh, but I mean, if, yeah. If the if the the particles can be confined in, let's say, in the tube, okay. If you put huge magnets around the tube, why can't you confine them? Yeah, you. So the tube will produce. So if you can conf, if you uh, can trap them, for instance, with magnetic fields. So you're produce, producing a potential that looks like this. Okay. Let's. Uh, Sorry. 
Okay, so um, so let's say, uh, as Eliel says, let's say we have an ion trap, which means we have a potential well. An ion trap means that we have something that looks like a valley, which means that if you put a particle, then it's pushed towards the center. And let's say you have one particle, and it's in the valley, and it's trapped. That's great. Okay? But now let's say we, we have many particles. So to a first approximation, you can say, let's uh, neglect the force between them. So they'll be just scattered in the swell. But now you can calculate the force between them. And this will create for you a repulsive potential. And the repulsive potential will look like this. So if you have a small number of particles, then, uh, it will, then if you add these two potentials together, you will still have something that looks like this, which is still confined. But if you have a lot of particles, then it will become, okay? So you're limited by the number of particles you can have. So if you have huge electric fields, maybe you can confine a huge number of particles, but it's still, it's like million, millions of particles, millions of ions in the best case, which is million is 10 to the 6. Neutrals, you can have an Avogadro number, 10 to the 27. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, for example, if you manage to trap with optical traps, um, neutrals, and then you start with 10 to the 27 particles instead of a million, then you can do things like evaporative cooling, where you let a few, uh, a few atoms evaporate, and then you can go down to ex ridiculously low temperatures. This, in principle, you can do also with ions, but here you only have a million to begin with, so you won't reach really low temperatures. Okay? So you all, always have to know that uh, we can all do all these crazy things with ions, but, but we're always limited by the numbers. Okay, so um, so let's begin to talk about this uh, mineral thing that's called ion optics. And it turns out, so if you look at an uh, electron microscope, then uh, it actually is built very similar to how a regular microscope works. So it, it, a regular microscope has lenses, it has mirrors, and so on. All of these... Um, components you can also have for ions, okay? For instance, what is a mirror? It's a so, yeah, so if you have just two electrons and you, uh, you, are you put one voltage on one, and a smaller voltage on the other, so you have an electric field in this direction, which means that if you have an ion coming from here that is positively charged, then the electric field will bend it and it will come in the opposite direction. Okay? So this is uh, an electrostatic mirror. Okay. Similarly, you can also have a lens for ions. Okay. And in principle, there is something called the equivalence principle. The equivalence principle says that anything you can do with light using regular optics, you can also do with ions using ion optics. Okay? Where The idea is that the index of refraction is 
is replaced by 1 over So, so the electric potential plays the role of the index of refraction. Or more specifically, it's, it's 1 over the potential. Now, what is the intuition behind this? In regular optics, the movement of a beam of light is governed by something called the Fermat Principle, which has, says that light is always looking for the shortest uh, uh, travel time from beginning to end. Okay, so um, have you, has everyone here heard of Fermat's, Fermat's yes. principle? Anyone not heard of Fermat's principle? Okay, so the same thing actually happens with ions, except with ions, so again, the Fermat principle looks, says that just like light, ions will look for the fastest route between two points, but their velocity is governed by half mv squared, sorry. So their kinetic energy will be equal to their potential energy. It's the same principle. In most cases, it's Lagrangian, it's not. Uh, sorry? It, it's the same principle. It's Lagrangian in both cases. It's not. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's the same principle. Okay, so, so in principle, whatever we can do in optics with lenses and mirrors, we can also do in ion optics. But there is a caveat. A caveat means uh, there is like Siag. a Siag, like an ex exception, that uh, this potential that we apply, the electric potential, can't be anything we just want. Okay, we, in, in optics, if, uh, if you're very smart, you can have an index of refraction that has uh, all kinds of crazy shapes. But not everything you can imagine, you can also do with electric fields. Okay. So, okay. Needs so. to, uh, uh, well, Maxwell, Maxwell yeah, fine. Okay. The electric field has to. Sorry, uh, can you tell me your name? Yeah? Chaim. Chaim. So, like Chaim says, the electric field has to obey Maxwell's equations. First uh, Maxwell equation is that, so if you have vacuum, so if you don't have any charges, then the gradient of the electric field is zero in the absence of charges. Now the electric field is the gradient of the potential minus. So this means that the, so if we substitute this in here, we see that the gradient, the second derivative of the potential is equal to zero. And this is called the Laplace Now this actually has a very simple meaning. So this this uh, 
For those of you who are not physicists and are afraid of this, it actually has a simple uh, intuition behind it. What it means is that the potential at every point is an average of the potential around it. Okay? And for those who like uh, derivatives, so it, it means that the second derivative in x plus the second derivative in y plus the second derivative in z is equal to zero. Okay? So an example for a solution is uh, b is equal to a x. Okay? This is, this is a potential that goes like this. And that means you have a constant electric field in the x direction. And if you plug it in, then this, the derivative with respect, respect with y is 0, with respect to z is 0, but with respect to x, it's not 0. No, but the second derivative is 0. Oh, sorry, the first derivative is a, and the second derivative is 0. OK, so it's a base Laplace equation. And this is actually what we needed in order to make a mirror for ions. Okay, this is also what we need if we want to accelerate ions. Okay. So the easiest way to accelerate ions is to produce them in a high potential, and then when they are when they go down, they are just accelerated. So the potential, uh, the electric potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. Okay, so um, so the first method create ions in a high potential. Um, so we mentioned maybe the um, Thomson's experiments on electrons is the discovery of the, is the first time these, they discovered that uh, an atom has an internal structure. The first pe person who managed to uh, split the nucleus of an atom artificially I mean, radioactivity was known before that, so people knew already that the nucleus of atoms has an internal structure. But the first one who actually managed to break the nucleus is called Chadwick, and he used something called the Van de Graaff accelerator. So a Van de Graaff accelerator is, well, you have a, a Van de Graaff set over here in the physics demonstration where you, uh, you use a belt to charge up a sphere, um, and this way you can create voltages of uh, around a million volts. So, um, so, we, so that's what he did. He created a voltage of a million volts, created ions there, acceler accelerated them down to ground, and hit and had them imprint on the nucleus. Okay. So this is, um, so this is the the first way to accelerate ions. As people mentioned, um, the the problem always here is not to produce. An, uh, a potential, not to, but it's to keep it because if you produce a high potential, that means you have a lot of charge, and this charge doesn't want to stay there; it wants to break down. Okay, so the problem when you produce a lot of charge is that you have breakdowns. Okay, so um, this is the reason why accelerators t tend to be very big. So, um,
I said Chadwick, I was mistaken. It's 1932, Cockcroft and Walton, they built the first, uh, they were the first people to split the nucleus. And this is how they're, should I close more lights? Yes. Yeah, close more lights. Yeah, close more lights. And, uh, and this is how their accelerator looked like. So it's easy to produce 700 kilo, kilovolts, but it's hard to, to uh, have it stable without breakdowns. So that's why they had to have um, this chain here with very, very big uh, uh, resistors and very good insulation uh, so, that, so that you don't, so that this 700 uh, kilovolts, so it's 700,000 volts, doesn't break down to, to ground. So you apply the voltage between this top and the... In, between the top and the ground. Okay. And then when you produce ions here, they just go, they're accelerated downwards, and you have ions at 700,000 volts. Okay. Wouldn't the air just uh, break down? Yeah. So, um, so that's why you need this big distance. Okay. And it's governed by something called the passion curve. So, uh, so it's well studied how, uh, depending on the pressure and the temperature, at what voltages do you get the breakdown. And, and that's, that's called the passion curve. What it means actually in practice is that in, um, in your lab, when you, when you, if you have a, an experiment this size, then you can get about in the order of magnitude of a few thousand volts. You can get maybe to 20,000 volts, but not much, much more than that. And if you can afford to build something really big like this, then you can get to a few million volts, but not much more than that. That set the limit for a long time on experiments in nuclear physics and so on of a, a few million volts. Okay, so in, um, in the IBA machine here in the nano, you can get actually with a much smaller, with applying much smaller voltage, you can get actually to much higher energy of ions. And this is called the tandem approach. So the tandem approach is you actually have your ion source in ground. Okay, so you produce your ions in ground, which is very comfortable because that means you can touch your, your uh, experiment and you can, it's not on a million volts. And then you accelerate them to, let's say, a million volts uh, to the middle of the experiment. And in the middle of the experiment, what you do is you strip away electrons. So if you start with negative ions, that means you have at least one electron spare. If you strip out one electron, then it becomes neutral. But if you strip out two electrons, then it becomes positively charged. And now the same potential that... Uh, so now, instead of going up the potential, you go down the potential. So, so now you're accelerated to twice the, the voltage that you applied in the middle. But if you actually strip more than two electrons, then you can e even reach higher voltages. So, so this is the... Um, oh, sorry. So this is uh, how the IBA uh, works. So you have your ion source over here. So for example, you produce protons. And this actually... Um, you want to have them in this direction, so you accelerate them in the beginning to a few thousand volts. Uh, but then, here in the middle, you have about a million volts. And there's also this um, a mesh. So a mesh is a, a very thin foil that, with holes. And when the ions pass through the hole, then the electrons suddenly see that around them there is uh, an electric uh, grid, so they can just jump to the grid. But uh, the atoms, the nuclei, they're strong, they are heavy, so they can't just uh, pass to the grid, so they pass through. And then what happens is that the electrons are stripped away. And then, they're, um, and then in the second half of the experiment, they're accelerated a second time, and then you can uh, use them. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't understand like, what was the benefit of uh, doing this peeling off of the... Yeah, so 
you can get much higher. So for the same voltage you apply in the middle, you get at least twice the, the acceleration voltage. So if you put a million volts and you strip two electrons, then the ions are accelerated not to a million electron volt, they're accelerated to two million electron volts. But if you strip away uh, four electrons, they're accelerated to one plus three to four million volts. But, but why would the, 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 the electron would like to, to peel off? Ah, okay, so, so what happens, so the way it's done here is you have a grid, okay? And when you pass through the grid, then the grid is, an, is like, is wires, right? So the electron sees a conductor around it, and it can just jump to the conductor. It not necessarily always happens, but when it happens, but it can happen. But uh, the atoms are uh, heavier, so, so they can't just jump, so they, they have a big momentum, so they, can, so they pass onwards. That's the intuition. To go to the details, it's a little more complicated. And that's actually, uh, uh, it turns out that this kind of, this, oops, this kind of stripping only works when you accelerate your ions to, to around a million volts. So um, in, in lower energies, it's less effective. Okay, the second way you can uh, actually reach high voltages with high acceleration without applying too much high voltages is to apply the voltage many times. Uh, and this is called, so this is pulsed voltage acceleration. So let's say you have an ion, and when it passes through, uh, through uh, a region in your experiment, you suddenly in increase, the, increase the voltage. So, uh, so now it's on, on this high platform, and now it, when it uh, goes down, it accelerates. Okay? So, uh, so this way you can accelerate. Now, it turns out that jumping a voltage is much harder than just putting a voltage. So you can't, uh, when you jump a voltage, you can't reach the high voltages you would reach when you just put a constant voltage. But you can do this jumping many, many times. So, um, okay, so, so, um, so one example for, for many uses of this is you have uh, grids, you produce your, uh, a sample over here, you jump the voltages and the ions are accelerated to this direction. This is called Wiley-McLaren accelerators. Um, but this idea of jumping voltages is actually what's used in, uh, in, um, in the facilities that are trying to reach the highest acceleration voltages possible. So one idea is the, the idea of a synchrotron. So in a synchrotron what you have is you have particles moving around in a circle and, and, um, and throughout and, and what you can do is you can all, while they're running here you can uh, jump the voltages and let's say you only have one section where you jump the voltage but every round trip you jump the voltage so they slowly reach higher and higher uh, velocities. Um, the problem with synchrotrons is that when the ions uh, when the ions are deflected to move in a circle they also um, emit radiation and they slow down. So that's why um, the, they're now moving from synchrotrons to linear accelerators where they, the ions just move in one uh, line and then you have to jump the voltages in many many places along the way to, to reach a high voltage. And that's why you need a very long tube for that. So, um, so this is uh, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, if people don't... Uh, and this is the Stanford uh, Linear Accelerator. So we talked a little about... Uh, so we saw that a constant electric field is a solution to the Laplace equation, and it has many uses. For example, it, you can use it to accelerate particles, and um, and you can also use it for, as a mirror. Okay, how about a lens? Okay, so what is a lens? So, so.
So a lens in optics is, uh, is an element where if you come at different heights, you will have a different traje trajectory. So if you're on axis, you'll just move in the, s in the same direction. But if you're off axis, then you will be bent. Okay, and then an ideal lens, no matter which height you come, you're bent so that you'll meet at the focal point. Okay, that's an ideal lens. Um, now, a constant electric field doesn't have any focusing. Okay, so if you have a constant electric field, if you have like a capacitor and you have an electric field in this direction, then if you come, let's say this is your optical axis, if you come along the optical axis, you'll come back the same way. But if you come here, then you'll also come back the same way. It doesn't depend on your distance. So, so you need to do something. So in order to have lensing, you have to have something that's not a constant electric field. You have to have something that, um, that, break, that, uh, that is very different from a constant electric field. Now, I like to think about uh, this as what happens when you do ion optics is that you apply potentials on the electrodes, uh, which is boundary conditions. So you apply boundary conditions, and then uh, nature is looking for a solution to Laplace equation that will satisfy. So, so you uh, you apply voltages in, on the edges. That's the boundary, and then nature is trying to solve this. And nature is always trying to find the simplest solution. So if a constant field will solve your solution, will solve this, then uh, then uh, then you're done. So you need to apply something that's very different than a constant than a constant electric field. So the Easiest way to do this is something called an Einzel lens. And the idea of an Einzel lens is three electrodes. So every electrode actually is is like a it's a, it's a cylinder. So it's it's a, it's a cylinder and the ions pass through it. And what you do is you apply ground to the two uh, to, to the two outer electrodes, and you apply a high voltage in the middle. So then, if you look at the electric field, then along the electrode here, the potential is constant. Along this electrode over here, the potential is also constant, and then down here is also constant. But here it's higher, so the electric field, the potential goes something like this. And this is not something that looks like a constant electric field. It's not something that looks like this. Especially there's these two, there's these points where the field, the derivative of the field has to change very dramatically. And this causes the, the potential to, to have a spherical shape. So if you look at the lines of constant potential, they will look like this. And that means that now a particle that goes along the axis will go like this. But if the particle comes off the axis, then it will be bent by the potential. Um, Yeah. One use of examples of lenses. So, for example, an electron microscope. You have to uh, you have to have lenses for magnification, right? Can you use? Yeah. So. Um, so this is an example of how it looks. So you have. Ground, high voltage ground. Then the red lines are lines of a constant potential. So you see, actually, it's this Einstein lens is like two lenses, actually. One lens over here and another lens over here. And then if you have a parallel beam, then it will be focused to a point. Okay, so Where are the, the electrodes? 
this is an, one electrode, this is the second electrode, and this is the third one. Okay? And it's a cylinder, so it's like a cut in the cylinder. So the red lines are the lines of constant potential, and uh, the blue lines are, are the, how the, the particle trajectory. So the particles start as a stri straight line, and they're focused to a point, just like uh, an optical lens. How do you know that they are propagating in a straight line? Because you didn't, you are... You, you created them by... So this is a simulation and a simul... Yeah, this is a simulation, so in the simulation you can put whatever you want. Okay? okay? But you can but, uh, accelerate them before the lens. Yeah, but usually uh, yeah, you produce them in a source, so they'll actually come in... Uh, they'll actually be coming from a point like this, yes. and then you can use a lens to straighten them, and a lens yeah. to focus them, and you can magnify, and all the tricks you do with optics you can do in principle, with ion optics, yeah. Why did you say there's two lenses? Uh, if you look at the potential, there is one lens here. Yes. Because of this point, and then there's one lens here. Because of this point. You see, all the, all the trick is with these two points, where the potential suddenly has to drop from a high voltage to a small voltage. Okay, but then if you want to um, have a lens, then you should... Only one lens, then... Yeah, but a combination of lenses is like one lens. Mm, okay, okay, so you so you can use. Yeah. It. Okay, so um, so this is an example of uh, of how you have a lens for ions, and that's important uh, for electron microscopes where you want to magnify. It's important for focused ion beams where you have a beam and you want to focus it to a small point. Um, it's it's important when you want to transmit ions for a long distance because. They'll always uh, want to spread, so you have to focus them back. Okay, so this is lenses. Um, Now, if you have the um, now, there's many advantages to work not with electric fields but with magnetic fields. One advantage is you, if you have um, ions that are very fast, that have let's say an, a voltage of a million volts, then in order to turn them, you have to apply voltages of the same order of magnitude, and uh, and that's hard. So, but with magnetic fields, uh, you can you can bend them. Another advantage of magnetic fields is that you actually can have the, um, the magnets with outside of your vacuum chamber. So you can uh, service them and operate them very easily. With electric fields, you have to have the, um, your vacuum tubes are usually made out of metals, so uh, they'll shield any external field, so you have to have all your electrodes within the device. There's one nice thing about not using magnetic fields. And the nice thing is that the trajectory of ions in electric fields alone does not depend on their mass. Okay? So let's say you built an instrument. Let's say you built an instrument called the time of flight. This is time of flight, mass spectrometer. So in this instrument, what you have is you have two electrodes to accelerate your ions. Then you have a mirror. which bends them, and then they reach a detector over here. And it turns out that the time that um, takes the ions to reach from the beginning to the end, the time will be proportional to the square root of the mass. Okay? 
So by measuring the time, you can tell what the mass of your ions are. Okay? So this is a good way of, of measuring the mass of ions. Or more precisely, it's the mass over the charge. But the, the, the reason this experiment works so nicely is that this, if you accelerate protons, or if you accelerate um, ura uranium plus, or if you accelerate a strand of DNA, they'll all move in exactly the same trajectory. The, the, so the trajectory does not depend on the mass, only the time. So, so that means you don't have to, if you want to move between one ion to another, you don't have to scan the, the electric fields. So, so this is a big advantage of doing things without magnetic fields. In magnetic fields, the trajectory will depend on the mass. I'll say a little bit about magnetic fields. So you probably heard a little about it. So if you have a, a constant electric field in the z direction, then what does that do to ions? Uh, Lorentz law will be... Yeah, so it turns out that the force due to a magnetic field, let's call it Fb, has a strange uh, phenomena that it goes like QV cross B. What does it mean? So first of all, if the ions are at rest, if they're not moving, there is no magnetic force on them. And the second thing is that the force is always perpendicular both to the velocity and to the magnetic field. Okay? So let's say you have a magnetic field in the Z direction. So this is the direction of the magnetic field and you're starting to move let's say in the y direction so the force will be uh, QV cro cross sorry it's the right hand rule right so V cross B so the f sorry yeah so it will be in the X direction so you will start bending like this and now the force will be again in this direction, so you will bend and you'll move in a circle. Okay? So the magnetic field acts like a centripetal force. Now, it, the, the trajectory in this case will depend on the mass. Because if you have a, a, more, a heavier particle, it's, it's harder to bend it, so it will move in a larger circle. So um, one use of this is for mass spectrometry. So you can have your, you can have ions, and you move them through a magnet, and depending on the magnetic field, only ma uh, only ions with the right mass will continue in the right direction. So um, so for example, in the IBA uh, machine in the nano building. Then you accelerate ions to a high velocity, and then you want to know exactly which ions you're using. So you deflect them with. So you use magnets to deflect them and and uh, and select them according to ma mass over charge ratio. Um, okay, I think this is what I'd like to say about. Uh, and if you use inhomogeneous homogeneous magnetic fields, you can also focus uh, ions just like you focus them with electric fields. And once again, you do that when you're working with ions that have a very high kinetic energy. Um, so uh, with electric fields, it won't be enough. So you, you need to use magnetic lenses. Um, yeah. Left told us in, in uh, atomic uh, mm -hmm. physics, atomic physics, that um, uh, different spins 
uh, will uh, will have different trajectory. Yeah. So so. Uh, do, do you count this? No. So so this is uh this is the force. Just ignore spin, and yeah. would only has to do with a charge. Yeah, I know. Okay. So. If you have a spin and you have an inhomogeneous magnetic field, not a constant field, but an inhomogeneous magnetic yeah. field, then you'll feel a force, and this force is orders of magnitude smaller than this. So it okay. won't. So so uh, so so if you want to see that, you need to use. <coughs> this is, for example, the stern gerlach yeah. experiment. So uh, so it's hard to see the effect of a spin on top of this force, but it's possible, and stern gerlach did it, right? But you need an inhomogeneous magnetic field. So it's like uh, a dipole in an electric field. Okay? So um, if you have an electric dipole and you have an electric field in this direction, so the positive charge go is, is, has a force in this direction, the negative in this direction, overall zero force. But if you have an inhomogeneous field, so the plus feels a stronger field than the minus, then you'll have an over, overall yes. force. Uh, when you said earlier in the lens, you mentioned that you are, try, you are focusing the, the beams, but they have, uh, they will repel each other. Yeah, so... Uh, how, how... Yeah. What is the point... Uh, the smallest point. Yeah, okay. So, what time is referring to is we mentioned in the beginning that the ions also repel each other. So usually when you build instruments you start you designing neglecting the repulsion and then whatever you calculate is true if you work with very low ion current. If you have a high current it's as if you have another lens that is uh, that is reflecting uh, um, it's a dispersive. It's as if you have a dispersive lens, okay? Uh, and you can account for it. So you can. Uh, so the ion beam can uh, disperse, and then you focus it back, okay? But uh, yeah, the with when you have a high current, you can't get the resolution that you have with the low current. It's always uh, like that in physics, yeah, because you want. The best of all worlds. You want as much signal and as good resolution, but it's always one in, uh, in the still expense still of still a, a resolution. You get like, if, you, if you're talking about focused ion beams, you get like a spot size of roughly two nanometers, even less. Yeah. So, um, Yeah so, so, or yeah, so they're using uh, fields in the order of magnitude of one Tesla, okay? Um, but, I mean, usually it's 0 0.1 Tesla or 0 0.5 Tesla or something like that. But it, it all, all depends on the energy of the ions. So if you go to CERN, where, you, where instead of uh, having a few kilo electron volt, you have uh, tera electron volt, then you, have, you, you need to use much stronger magnets. Okay, so um, so in the beginning when I uh, uh, had this schematic drawing of the of Thompson's experiment, then we had an ion source in the beginning, which for, for John T Thompson it was just a cathode, and then we there was ion optics in the middle. And finally, there is the detector or a sample in the end where we shoot the ions. Um, so I'll say a, f a few words about the detector. So the one thing that is nice with ions is that once you accelerate them, if you accelerate something to a high voltage, if something has a high kinetic energy, then it's very easy to detect it. Okay? So, for example, you have a detector called a channel tron. 
and if a particle, and it, the particle doesn't even have to be charged, if a particle hits and it has an, a kinetic energy of larger than approximately one kilo electron volt, then, then you can see a single particle. Okay? How does it work? So in a channel trunk, a channel trunk looks like a tube, like this, and within this tube there is an electric field, a strong electric field that goes in this direction. So what, actually it's in the opposite direction, so you'll see in a second. So what happens is, so what, in the channel trunk you have um, negative potential here and zero potential over here or let's say zero and, and a positive potential over here. So what happens is when you, when a particle hits the, the channel trunk, then as a result of the collision, then a few electrons will come out. And now the electrons are accelerated by this electric field, so they hit the, the tube again, and now they emit even more electrons. And, and so on. They, they keep getting accelerated and each time you multiply the number of electrons. So in the end you have, um, so this, it's a kind of an avalanche and then you have a lot of electrons and then you get a strong signal that you can measure. They don't interact with each other? The electrons they do, but doesn't matter. They, you, don't you don't care about it. You have so many. So you have so many, it's an avalanche, so you're sensitive and you can see a single particle. Okay? Um, I have a question? Yeah. Is it sensitive enough to distinguish between, uh, let's say, one particle and two particles? It was, it yeah, so if the two particles have uh, some time between them, then, and this time, the time it takes to read out a single particle is less than a nanosecond. Okay, so, so up to a nanosecond, you can distinguish between two bits? Yeah, bits? exactly. Um, one thing you, this is an avalanche, so the height of the signal in the end will be random. So you can't tell much about the particle except that it, a particle hit. Um, then you can have... Completely random? I mean, there isn't, there isn't any... Yeah, so in, uh, in principle, if... In principle, if the first particle has a higher energy, then it will produce more electrons in the beginning, so you'll have a higher signal. But, uh, but it's so random that it's very hard to see these differences. So you can't uh, measure the mass of a particle by just the height of the signal. But you see that a particle is hit. You can take this channel tron idea, and you can make many, many, many ch channel trons, and then you get a detector called an MCP. It's called a microchannel plate micro channel light and uh, so that's you can think about it as two plates that have a high voltage between them so let's say zero volts here and two kilovolts here and you have a lot of these uh, channels so a particle hits it produces electrons and the electrons undergo this avalanche and then you can measure the current here and you'll see a strong current for every particle. You can also put a phosphor screen behind here and then each time a particle hits you'll also see a, a point of light and then you can also say where the particles hit on the detector. So you can get both the time and the position of each hit on the detector. Uh, so for those of you who uh, do, uh, do my physical chemistry uh, course, so this is how you do all these imaging experiments that I told you a little about. Um, yeah, and, and then you can have even a more sophisticated detector. So this detector works from one kilo electron volt, but uh, let's say you have a uh, a diode, um, and let's say, so an electric diode, okay. 
And in this diode, you have the energy to produce an electron hole pair is something like zero, half a volt or something like that. So if you have a particle with one kilovolt that enters in here, then it will produce uh, 2,000 electron hole pairs. That's enough, volt, that's enough current to measure. And, then you can, and if the particle hits with two kilovolts, then it produces twice as many electron hole pairs. So in principle, you can measure the kinetic energy of the particle that hits. But also, you can put a lot of uh, those detectors one uh, one next yeah. to the other, and when you, when you uh, the particle will move, it will move through it, but it will it will pass it. So yeah. You okay. I'll, 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 them. Yeah, you're talking about more sophisticated detectors in CERN, but this let's say the particle is completely absorbed in the diode then the, its whole kinetic energy goes into electron hair, hole pairs. So then you can not only see that a particle hit, but you can also measure the kinetic energy of the particle. Or, or you can measure its mass or stuff like that. The problem is that uh, a particle of a kilovolt energy will not go into the diode because it will, it will be stuck on the surface. But, it, but this works very well if you have particles with millions of volts of energy. So with millions of volts of energy, you can actually measure the energy of each particle. If, like you say, you have uh, particles with uh, giga. giga electron volts, then they will pass through the detector, create here an avalanche, so you can measure that they arrived here. But then be behind it, you can have another detector, and then you can really trace the, the line. The trajectory. The trajectory. And that's what they're doing in, in the big accelerators, like, uh, like the Large Hadron Collider and so on. Um, okay, so this is just a small primer about detectors. I won't go into more details about them. And then, so we talked about the ion optics, we talked about the detectors, then we can have a whole course about the ion sources. Because, uh, um, because there's many different ion sources and you... But we won't have a whole course, I'll just give you a few examples. Many, many examples of ion sources. I'll just give a few examples for, for ion sources. The simplest kind of ion source is an oven. So if, it, if you have a material and you heat it up to a high temperature, then first of all it will emit electrons, but it will also start to evaporate. Okay? So for example, the sim maybe the simplest kind of oven is just what you have in a light bulb. It's just a wire from tungsten. And if you pass current through the wire, then it heats up, and, um, and then it emits electrons. But it also starts evaporating. So you can put, uh, for instance, gold on this wire, and it will start emitting uh, gold particles. Or you can, uh, you can have a little ceramic and put your a powder inside, and you can put a wire around it. So you heat up this oven, and uh, and it will start. Particles will start coming out. Up. Okay, but if we come back to the simple uh, way of making electrons, once you have electrons, and you can use them to make other kinds of particles. So, for example, you can have a gas, and if you shoot electrons at this gas, then electrons can uh, ionize, so they can knock off electrons from the particles in the gas, or they can attach and form negative particles. So once you have electrons, you can uh, start making ions as much as you want. Or if you have simple, uh, for instance, if you heat up sodium, you can use it to sputter, so you can uh, fire. So for example, in archaeology, what do you do in archaeology? So 
in archaeology, you want to uh, do carbon dating. So you want to see what the age of a material is by the amount of carbon-14. So you dig up a site, you, have, uh, you look for something organic, something uh, that has carbon inside. Uh, you take it to the lab, you put your sample over here, then you shoot, um, usually it's cesium ions, at the sample, and this will cause carbon minus to come off in the other direction. Um, and carbon has uh, three, three main isotopes. It has carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 minus. And by the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, you can tell the age of a sample. The problem is that carbon-14 is in a very, very tiny amount. So, so, you, so to be sensitive to that, you need to accelerate to a million volts. You need a magnet. And so it's... Uh, so... Uh, in the Weizmann Institute, for example, there is a, an accelerator that looks that is similar to the IBA machine here in uh, Barilan, but a little smaller, and it's used for archaeology. Yeah. And then you can have more uh, sophisticated uh, uh, ion sources. So if you want huge currents, then what you want to produce is a plasma. A plasma is, is uh, like a fourth uh, phase of matter, so you have a solid liquid gas, but if the gas, you completely ionize it, so it, the gas is full of electrons and, and cations, then it's a plasma, and then you can have this plasma leaking into your system and you get a huge current. So, uh, so this is a, is a picture of a very simple plasma source where you just have one electron, you put a high voltage, you create a breakdown, and you have a plasma inside. Um, this is an example of a more sophisticated uh, ion source. This is called electrospray ionization. And, and this is very good for making huge molecules. And the idea is you can ionize them without breaking them apart. Because all of the stuff that I told you about so far was very violent. So you, can, so you make things, but you also break them apart. Here it's a very gentle source. So the idea is you take a, uh, a liquid a solution that has the molecules you're interested in, and you apply a high voltage. So the high voltage will cause the solution to be pushed in this direction, but the surface tension causes it to form a shape of a cone. And then from the tip of the cone, you have a spray. So a spray is, is many little droplets that are accelerated by the field, and the droplets are charged, so they're accelerated by the field. And as they are accelerated, they start to evaporate until eventually all the droplet evaporates and you only have the molecules that are in the center of the droplet. So this is called electrospray ionization. And this is actually how it looks. So, uh, so you have the sample coming in here. It forms this cone called the Taylor cone. And then from the tip, you have this uh, spray of droplets that are, um, that are pulled to your vacuum system. OK, so, um, so I think this brings us to the next topic, which is, uh, unless you have more questions, so the next topic will be ion traps. Now, is it OK, actually, that we continue without a break? Uh, because it's a bad time for a break. And, uh, and I want actually uh, afterwards to take you to the lab and show you an ion trap with, the, with, the, with particles that you can actually see. OK, 
Okay, so ion traps are traps for ions. So you can hold ions and keep them. And why would you want to do that? So do you have any ideas for why should you use traps? What's, uh, what's good about traps? Maybe for reactions. For reactions? So let's say you want to study a collision between A and B. So it's good maybe to have B standing in place and then shooting A at it. Okay. What, what else? Other ideas? Yeah, two. So, okay, so, so once particles are inside an ion trap, then you can manipulate them and you can. Uh, isolate them from the surrounding, you can uh, set their internal temperature, you can mass select them, you can do all kinds of tricks on them when they're inside an ion trap. Uh, any other ideas why ion traps are good? If you want to examine them. Yeah, why, why is it good to trap them if you want to examine them? Because we have them on one Yeah, and what? Okay. And Okay, so the other good thing is that the long, long times so I guess you all know the um, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that says the delta P times delta X is H bar. But there's also a second, a second Heisenberg uncertainty. Yeah, that says that delta E times delta T is uh, larger than H bar. So if you can make delta T very long, very large, you can make delta E very small. So, so let's. So one example for how this is works, how this works is, let's look at the time of flight mass spectrometer. Okay. So you accelerate ions, and you measure how long it takes them to get to the detector, um, and then from the time you can measure their mass. But you'll always have a result. There'll always be a limit to how good you measure the time. So your resolution is is defined as t divided by delta t. Okay, so how, what is the time and how good can you measure the time? Now, often it's not, um, there's not much you can do about delta t, but t is something you can do a lot about. So for example, in the mass spectrometer I showed you here, why do they have a mirror? Because a mirror increases the time by two without change, and then actually it also helps with delta t. So it helps in both accounts. But uh, it, it increases the time by a factor of two. Okay? So, um, it, but the time here is usually in these mass spectrometers is very small. It's about a microsecond. If you store in a trap for a second, then you increase the time by a factor by six orders of magnitude. So you have a six order of magnitude resolution in time. So the best mass spectrometers in the world all use uh, ion traps. Yeah, I didn't understand why holding the ion for a long time would help you. you don't do something. Yeah, so we didn't, I didn't explain to you how we measure their mass. But in principle, uh, it still goes something like this. So the, the mass, the time scales of the square root of the mass. So if you can uh, trap for a very long time, you can get a very high resolution in mass. Okay? I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll give you a, one example of a very simple trap. So let's, instead of having one mirror, let's have two mirrors. And then the ions are going like this. So it's just like this, but instead of increasing the time times two, you increase the times times... Uh, 
a hundred thousand or something. Ah, so the flink still will be stable. Yeah. If, okay. So. okay. So there's many more advantages of ion traps. Um, you can laser cool ions in ion, tra ion traps, and then you can do quantum uh, computation with these ions and all kinds of crazy things. But there's also one problem with ion traps. And this is the Laplace equation. So before we talk about the problem, let's say a little bit of a word about what is a trap. And actually, we mentioned it a little bit in the first hour, but a trap is a potential will. A potential well is something that looks like this. Um, which, and the force, if you remember, is the, so this is how the potential looks. And the force is the derivative of the potential. So what it means is that if you're in the bottom of the well, then the derivative is zero, so there is no force on you. But if you're in this, going a little to the right, then there is a force, there is a returning force in this direction that pushes you back to the center. And if you're in this direction, then the force also pushes you back to the center. So this is a potential well. And this is what you need for a trap. Except this is a potential well in one dimension. And um, we're living in a three-dimensional world. So, um, so if we want particles to be trapped, we need to, to have a three-dimensional potential well. Okay. So we need the potential, the electric potential, to look something like Ax squared plus y squared plus z squared. But what is the problem with this? It doesn't equal 3 to 0. No, it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy the Laplace equation. It doesn't obey the Laplace equation. Okay? But in long so term, it will obey. Because you have a force. Let's, and let's accelerate, it will radiate. In a very long time, so we will be zero practically. So, so the potential? So this is what we want as a potential. I'll call it a V3D. But the potential has to satisfy the Laplace equation. And the Laplace equation is gradient V should be equal to zero. But the problem is the second derivative with respect to x is a. Second derivative with respect to y, sorry, it's 2a. Is also 2a. With respect to z is also 2a. So the gradient is 3 times 2a, it's 6a, and that is not equal to 0. Um, maybe you can provide this sort of potential with the source. With I mean, what? If you have a source, um, I mean, you're not in a vacuum anymore, you do have something that... A charges or something. charge, yes. Okay. So maybe then you, it, it wouldn't have to be 0, and then it just... Okay, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, so, now this is not just because I made a wrong choice here. Because if you remember, what is the intuition of the Laplace um, equation? It says that the potential in every point is an average of the point next to it. And the minimum cannot be the average of points around it. Okay, because a minimum is smaller than all the points next to it. So, Laplace so Laplace equation seems to rule out uh, a trap. And this is called Ehrenstrahl theorem. So what? The, what is it called? 
I'll, I'll just I'll write it in a second. So Ehrenstrahl theorem says that you cannot trap particles at rest using static electric fields alone. So how come I've been talking about ion traps and mentioning that this whole course is on ion traps if you have Ehrenstrahl theorem that says that you cannot have ion traps? You can put it in a place where you move in circles, so it's be good enough. Okay, so um, that's one idea. So. <coughs> So what physicists start doing in order to make ion traps is treating this uh, theorem by Ehrenshaw uh, the same way as lawyers treat an agreement. Okay, when lawyers read an agreement, they immediately look for loopholes. So the question is, can we find loopholes in this um, this statement? And what's your name? Ilan. Ilan. So Ilan is uh, noticed one loophole, and this is the word at rest. Okay, so Elon is saying maybe we can trap particles, but they, they're, not move, they're not at rest, maybe they're moving, and then we can trap them. Okay? And, um, and this will lead to storage rings. Can anyone else find loopholes? Yeah. The static. If you can change the electric field to move. Also, electric alone. You can use magnetic fields. Okay, so. And. Also, you have this, who said alone? Eliyahu, so, so you can have Yuval well, actually, um, she also mentioned, okay, maybe we can have electric field and also charges. And uh, I know of one kind of trap that works like that. It's called an electron ion beam trap. It's called, yeah, an electron beam ion trap, EBIT. And the idea is you have a beam of electrons that goes through your trap, and it kind of uh, creates a confining, uh, it kind of creates a charge that, that uh, um, that uh, attracts positive ions. So you can trap ions by a beam of electrons that is passing through. Uh, that's the only kind of trap I know from this. I know of another one who was trying to build something similar, but uh, I never heard that he managed, so I don't know about him. Okay, so um, these two are the... So, um, so let's start with the green one. So the green one is known as uh, as pole traps, and also you'll you'll find the words linear, ion trap, and so on. 
Paul is the guy who got a Nobel Prize for developing this kind of trap. Uh, Wolf and Paul. And Penning is the guy who developed this kind of trap. So he got a Nobel Prize together with Paul. Isn't it about the same? Because um, if you uh, will have an um, electric uh, field that changes with, with time, then it produces a magnetic field? It's so a very small magnetic field that's mm -hmm. ne negligible okay. compared to this. So this is known as a Penning trap. This is also known as FT, as ICR or FTICR. So, um, so I'll give you a brief introduction to each one of these traps, and then we'll go and see one. Is it okay to continue or you guys need a break? Okay, so the idea of uh, following idea. So you use an electric field that is a trap in the z direction. So so you have something that looks like a z squared. But then, in order to satisfy the Laplace equation, then it has to be non-trapping in the x and y direction. So this is a potential that looks like a saddle. So in the z direction, it, goes, it looks like this. But in the x, y direction, it looks like this. Okay? This is x and y. So this is a saddle. So it looks ah, like this, something like this. Okay, so in one direction you're trapped, in the other direction you are stored. And then you combine this. Combine it with the magnetic field in the z direction. So what happens? So if you're moving in the z direction, then you're moving in this potential, and you're actually not affected by the magnetic field. Because uh, if you're moving in the z direction, then the magnetic force is v cross z, it's zero because the magnetic field is also in the z direction. So in the z direction, you're just moving up and down. But what happens if you're moving in the x, y direction? So if you're exactly in the center, then you're, ex you're at the top of this hill. So in principle, there's no force acting at you. And if you also have zero velocity, then you're just staying put in the center. But let's say that you have a little velocity, or you're a little bit off center. Let's say you're a little bit over here. Um, so now the potential will, the electric field will push you to move in this direction. So you'll start moving in this direction. But as you move, your velocity grows. And what happens to a particle that has a velocity in a magnetic field? Changes speed. It starts moving in a circle. Okay? And then, so it comes close, but the 
and slows down, but then the electric field pushes it in this direction. So it starts moving and creating a motion like this. But every time it crosses uh, the y axis, it will come inside. Yeah. So uh, so what? Ha so each time. So the magnetic field wants it to go in a circle, but each time it comes close, then the electric field pushes it away, and this makes this uh, circular motion, but it's confined. It will never run away too, too, uh, too fast, because when it's, when it's running away, there is a high velocity and then a high restoring magnetic field that pushes it back. Okay? It won't be closer and closer. Sorry? Every time it will cross the y-axis, it will push inside. No, it turns out that uh, it stays confined. It stays in a symmetric. I didn't draw it uh, nicely, but it's the center remains the same. So it goes like this. Um, how many particles can this um, trap? Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So once again, it. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it would be. In, in the order of a million particles maximum, depending on the magnetic field. The more, the higher magnetic field, the more particles you can So you, you don't look at quantum phenomena? You can look at quantum yeah. phenomena if you want. Why not? Because when it's, uh, when it's macroscopic... So uh, some, of the most in, uh, some of the most important experiments in quantum mechanics have been done in ion traps. Okay? And How small can you make it? The penning trap? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how, how do you... Uh, you need the... I, I don't know about uh, experiments that Actually, try to miniaturize penning traps. But in principle, I don't see a reason why it can be miniaturized. But how, how do you create this electric field? Uh, okay, so if you want an electric field that looks exactly like this... So that still looks like it doesn't satisfy the Laplace equation. This, it does. Oh, because of the the z squared. Okay. Okay. Now, if you want to produce a field that looks exactly like this, then you need to have electrodes that have a shape of a of a parabola. Okay, because that's a shape where v is constant. Uh, okay. So and that's what Penning did originally. So he built. Uh, let's uh, let me show you this to show this to you. that I got confused. It's named after Penning, but the guy who actually built it, and I think he's also the guy who got the Nobel Prize, was Demet. Okay, so um, to make this quadruple uh, fields, then uh, you use a ring electrode like this and end caps, and they have to be the shape of a parabola to make it uh, look exactly right. Yeah, I thought I had a, a nice picture of it. I'm sorry. But uh, this is how a penning trap would look in practice. Okay, and you put this in a high magnetic field. Now, the, these two motions, so if you have a trap and it's a 3D trap, that means you oscillate in three directions. There is, there is in this case, one oscillation in XY. Then there is these small oscillations that are like uh, regular oscillations that you do in a magnetic field. And then, so you have these small oscillations. This is one frequency. And then you also have this longer frequency that you go like this. 
So these are known as the cyclotron motion and the magnetron motion. And in addition, there is this motion up and down in the z direction. And this is, this is something that will always be true. So if you have a three-dimensional trap, you will have three, fre three frequencies. And the point is that each of these frequencies is, depends on the charge to mass ratio of the ions. So, um, so each of them can, by measuring each of these frequencies, you can measure the mass of the ions. And you can do all kinds of other things. For instance, if you excite the ions at the right frequency, you can cause them to, to be ejected from the trap. So you can, you can excite the, the magneton motion, and then, and then the ions will each time go further and further away until they are thrown out. Or you can measure these motions, and, uh, and then you can measure the mass of the ions. And actually, the most uh, high-resolution mass spectrometers are mass spectrometers based on penning ionization. Um, pen, penning traps, sorry. And it turns out that the shape of the trap doesn't have to be this, this exact, you don't have to have an exact potential that looks like this, which means that the electrodes don't have to be exact hyperbolas. We can have all kinds of, you can have a square configuration and it still works. Okay, it's just then the frequencies are harder to compute and they're not, it's not harmonic potential, so, so the frequency will depend on amplitude and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and if you want to measure the frequency, you also have to somehow uh, see the ions in the trap. And the point is that when an ion moves, then it creates a, it in, induces an electric charge on the electrodes. So you can measure this induced charge and then you can see the frequencies. So what you, so actually you can't see ions that are standing at rest, you can only see ions that are oscillating. So in all these, these crazy configurations, what you have is electrodes that are used to excite the, the ions, to make them move, and then electrodes that are used to image the charge. And, um, and that leads to these very sophisticated uh, uh, traps that are used as mass spectrometers, then they're called ion cyclotron resonance. And you measure the frequency, so you do a Fourier transform, and that's why they're called Fourier transform ICR, FTICR. And if you have a trap that looks very beautiful, like an hyperbola, then you have very nice trajectories. If you have a trap that is, looks like a box, <laughs> then the trajectories look really ugly, but it still works as a trap. Okay, so the second uh, exception that we found to the Ehrenshaw theorem is that uh, we mentioned before that it's using static electric fields. We can use fields that are not static, fields that are changing with time. And um, Yeah, so the idea of the, the idea is the following. Let's say, and this is called, this idea is called the ponder motive potential. So let's say you have a stick, and this is a, a trap. It's a stable, uh, stable uh, a point, but you also have an unstable point over here, right? Because if it goes in this direction, it falls. But if I'm very good, then I can stabilize the stick, right? And what what I'm doing is I'm looking where it goes, and I move my hand, feedback loop. like a feedback loop. 
But it turns out that you can do this even without feedback. So if I move my hand uh, fast enough, then it's stable even without any feedback. Okay? And this is, this is based on something called the pointed motive potential. So how does this work? So it turns out that if you have a, a force that is oscillating in time, but there is a region where it oscillates very strongly, and the region where it oscillates weaker in a smaller amplitude, then what will happen is that the particles will be repelled from the region with a high amplitude to the region with a low amplitude. And that's called the ponder motive potential. And uh, maybe you can raise your hands if you want. Do you want me to prove to you how it works, to do, do, to do the derivation or not? Because I see that people are, OK. OK, so, uh, so I'll do this. I'll try to do it quickly. So what happens is high amplitude or high uh, what is there? This is the amplitude. So high, high amplitude. The frequency doesn't matter. It does matter. For example, if the frequency is zero, if the field is not changing, then you have no trapping. Okay, so the frequency matters. So the particles are pushed from the region with high amplitude to the region with low amplitude. That's the idea of the ponder motive potential. I'll just say how you can use it as a trap. So let's say you have a saddle, like this, and now you turn it around. Okay? So, um, so you have a saddle like this, and now you start turning it. So the points here start oscillating with a high amplitude, but the point in the middle is not oscillating at all. So the particles will be will move from will, will be pushed towards the middle, and you get a trap. Okay? So that, that's the idea of the ponder motive potential. So um, how does it work? So, so the um, Newton's equation, so the acceleration of the particle, is a force that is oscillating with time. And the amp G is the amplitude of the force, and the amplitude depends on the position. That's the crucial point. So now we, the um, trick is to divide the position. It's an approximation, but the trick is you divide the position into, into a slow component and the fast component. So, so what will happen when, you, when the particle is here in the high amplitude, then the first thing it will do is it will move very rapidly with the electric field. So this is the fast motion. It's called the micro motion. So it, but then there's also the slow motion that it slowly drifts in this direction. Okay. So what this means is, is it's fast, so the derivative of x is much larger than the, der than the derivative of x0. But on the other hand, x0 is, so this motion here is much faster than this motion here. But on the other hand, x0 can be much larger than x1. So now we can uh, substitute this in here, and we say that x0 plus x1 is equal to g of x0 plus x1 times cosinus omega t. 
and you can do a Taylor expansion of g. So it's g of x0 plus dg dx times x1 and x1 are not small, so how, so okay, this approximation is just, not. So, so far it's not an approximation. So far I just replaced x by x plus x0 plus x1, and so far it's consistent, okay? Mm. I didn't do anything yet. Okay, I, I, um, I neglected the high orders, right, yeah. in, G, in the Taylor expansion, mm -hmm. but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now, now we want to collect the largest terms. So the derivative of x is much, it's larger than x0, so the second derivative is also much larger. So x1, the second, so in this side you can neglect x0, and in this side you can actually neglect this term. So this will be equal to g of x0 cosinus omega t. So you get actually a simple equation for x1. Why can you neglect the... Because x1 is small compared to x0. And this is the derivative of g. The, the g changes slowly. Yeah. So, so this term is small compared to this one. So this, these are the leading terms. And then we get a very simple uh, equation for the fast coordinate. It's just an harmonic oscillator. Just x1 is equal to uh, minus g x0 divided by omega squared cosinus omega t. And now the second stage is we can plug this back in here and then x1 dot plus gx0 times cosinus omega t dies. dies and you're left with x0 times dg times x1 cosinus omega t. I'll do it uh, in this, I'll do it on this board. Sorry for the So, x0 will be equal to dg times dx times x1, and x1 we can uh, plug from here, so it will be minus 1 over omega squared g of x0 times cosinus omega t, right? Now the, there's a trick that d of g squared is equal to, to twice g times dg dx. So we, we have g times dgx, so x0 is equal to minus and then we, there's one final thing you can do is you can average x0 on one oscillation. Why? Because x0 is one, these oscillations are very fast and x0 is very slow. So you can make an average, so So you can make an average on one oscillation, and the average of cos, uh, why is it not, uh, it should have been cosine, or if I made a mistake. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, 
Yes, yes, it should have added cosine squared. It should cosine be cosine squared. squared. Why? Because you put x1 is uh, proportional to cos cosine squared. Ah, yeah. Right, so. Thank you. And the average of cosine squared on one oscillation is half. So now we have something that, so the acceleration looks like the derivative of something. And this is actually, uh, when you have a motion in a, fi in, a, in a potential, so x to time, the second derivative of x is equal to the force divided by m, which is minus and the dv dx like this so you have a relationship between the second derivative and the derivative of the potential so we, so we see that the derivative the potential looks like the amplitude square and if you do the math exactly then you get that uh, the potential will be m over q g x squared divided by 4 omega squared. So someone asked about the frequency. Yes, the frequency matters because the frequency goes into here. But, and the second thing that matters is, this, is the amplitude of the, of the field. So if you have a strong field, then it's like a big, poten big, uh, uh, big potential. So if you have a field that oscillates strongly here, and like this, then the effective potential will look like this. And then if it oscillates strong like over here, then it can look like this. Yeah? Uh, what about the phase between the central oscillation and the, the low oscillation? Because if I have uh, the same phase and uh, frequency with one wall, it might be pushed further away into the second wall. So it won't be very symmetric. Yeah, so, so, uh, so in our assumptions, we have the same uh, phase everywhere, but it doesn't matter the phase. So it will work anyway. Okay? Be exactly because this x0 motion is much slower than, uh, than anything else, so you don't care. This is v out or x0? Uh, so this is called the, sorry, let's call this vp, and this is an effective. Ponder motive potential. So it's an effective potential. It's not a real potential. So you have a particle, and it has a fast motion that's governed by the real potentials. And that doesn't know anything about this. But the point is, is while it's moving back and forward, it's feeling a higher force here than here. So it's, it's being pushed in this direction, okay? So then, so this effective potential is something that only determines the slow motion. So the slow motion will go like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. And if you have friction, if you have, for instance, a gas inside that, uh, that causes you to lose velocity when you collide, then you'll end up in the middle of the trap. So, so this is the idea of a pole trap. Just like Penning, Paul uh, built a trap that uh, uh, was, was based on quadrupole electric fields. And so it had sh electrodes that shaped, were shaped as, a, as an exact uh, hyperbola. And just like in Penning traps, it doesn't really matter what the shape of the trap is unless you want it to be very uh, harmonic. So 
this was a, the original trap of Paul, where he had a, a potential that really looks like a saddle that turns around. Um, then the most uh, actually useful trap of this kind is called a quadrupole iron trap, and the idea is that you have the saddle only in X and Y. Where, so it, you rotate freely in X and Y, and then in Z, it's, you just don't have any field along the trap in the Z direction. Only in the two ends, you have uh, end caps that are pushing you back in. So that means that in X and Y, you're confined. In the Z, you can move along the trap like this. This is used uh, a lot for all the experiments with laser cooling and quantum computation. They mainly use this kind of trap. Because you have ions on a string in the middle, and they can easily be addressed with a laser and cool down, and, and then you can do quantum computations and all kinds of other rubbish. Um, I didn't say this. <laughs> and it's also good for mass selection. So it turns out that if, in addition to the oscillating fields, you also apply a DC field, then the trapping will work only for specific masses. And then you can store the, tr uh, select ions according to their mass. And to do, to understand that, you need to uh, solve the Mathieu equation, and I won't go into that. I'll just mention that there is one trouble problem with these kinds of traps, and the problem is that you have this micro motion. You have this fast motion up and down. And this is bad if you uh, want to cool ions down, because what you, how do you cool ions down? You have a cold gas, and by collisions with the gas, you cool down. But if you're moving very fast, then the collisions will heat you up instead of cooling you down. So this, this is a bad trap for cooling stuff. Good for heating. It's good for heating, yeah. So th this is the original trap where you have a saddle that turns out and you're in one motion. You can have these quadruple ion traps and then you have the saddle only in X, Y and in Z you can move. But you have this heating. But it turns out that if instead of using four electrodes, you use more electrodes. For instance, eight electrodes or 22 electrodes, then what happens is that you have these oscillating, strong oscillating fields close to the electrodes, but towards the center, the, the fields, they cancel each other out. So in the center, there's no field at all. And the more electrodes you have, the bigger the region in the center where, where it's like a constant, where there's no field at all. So this is like a, like a bottle where in the middle you, you can move freely, no fields, and only when you come close to the edges, then you feel this force. And these traps are very, very good at cooling stuff down. Now, so I mentioned like in penning traps that the original trap had electrodes the shape of hyperbolas, but you can even have a trap that is made out of spoons. So what you have is an electrode in the middle where you apply a, an oscillating electric field and you can have two spoons for both sides and it still works. So you can see the particles, they, instead of looking like a dot, they look like a line. And that's because of this fast micro motion. And in addition, they, are, um, they have a slow motion uh, running around. And whoever wants to see this in uh, practice uh, come, can come after the lecture to my lab, and we build this uh, demonstration. It works very nicely. Uh, it's Hakionas. He's a second, degree, uh, second year bachelor. Um, student and he built this in our lab and it works really nice. Yeah, and here they turn on the light just to show you that it's actually made out of spoons. Spoon <laughs> magic. Spoon magic, yeah. It's only ghetto kind of. Uh... <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll uh, just briefly say. That the last uh, point you mentioned is that. So 
we had the Aaron Shaw theorem saying that particles can be, tra can be uh, trapped at rest by static electric fields alone. So you can also have particles that are not at rest, that are moving. So um, one way to do that is to use a storage ring. So the, the idea of storage ring comes from particle accelerators from synchrotrons. So this is like a synchrotron, except you don't accelerate the particles in it. So you have uh, particles from a particle accelerator. They move in, a, in the synchrotron around and around, and they're kept for as long as you want. Okay. Uh, the only problem with this is you need a huge accelerator to create them. Uh, you need a whole uh, team in the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg to operate this. Um, so it's a hard experiment, but it turns out you can do the same thing not with magnetic fields, you can do it with electric fields. And then you can have a storage ring that's much smaller. This is a storage ring that I worked a lot in in Denmark, and it's about the size of this uh, from here to the wall. And you can, this is something you can miniaturize very easily. So in the Weizmann Institute, um, Daniel Zeifmann, who's now the president of the Weizmann Institute, and he was also my advisor in the PhD. He said, let's do the same thing, but just with two mirrors. Okay, so, uh, so he was taking the equivalence of ion optics and electric optics, and just like you have a, cavit a laser cavity, it's two mirrors and the photons are going back and forth, you can have two mirrors for ions, and the ions are just going back and forward. So this is a trap this size. And now there's already a trap this size, so this is something can, that can be miniaturized very easily. Um, I think I'll stop here because, uh, um, because I see uh, you guys are already exhausted. But whoever wants to see uh, um, this ball trap in action, then please come with me to the lab. Okay, see you next week.